recording. All right, welcome, welcome everybody to uh, another Back to the Sal study session. Um, this is our 20th probably week, 21st, 20 some week. And today we are finishing the sword in two hands section, kind of wrapping it up a bit, and then we're moving on uh, from there. Um, so we have a lot of really interesting stuff um, to uh, do today. We're going to probably brush the Senyo page. We're going to finish the Sword and Two Hands section. We're going to look at this Dagger, Spear, and Club section. And then we're going to touch on the Senyo. We might get through this. I was thinking about maybe doing a whole section on the Senyo alone, but maybe not. Maybe we'll maybe we'll be able to do it in this, in, in this, in this session. So we'll see. We shall see. But a lot of really awesome and interesting stuff in front of us. Um, so as normal, do my little spiel. The purpose of this back to the self study course is, um, principally to, um, get a chance to look at, uh, the manuscript, specifically the Getty, which forms in the recruit program, the principal, uh, our principal primary source uh, at Emma. Um, it's a chance to look at the manuscript, to study it, um, certainly more than we might do if we were normally in the cell and, to to recognize that there's a lot of distance between, you know, the drills that we do and the skills that we train in the cell sometimes and the what's on the page in the manuscript. It takes a lot of uh, time and effort to effectively package um, all of this information into a curriculum that's, uh, you know, at least half understandable by somebody from our time and place. And um, it's always best if the study of um, uh, Armazare is done with both the manuscript and um, the words and actions and instructions of um, the instructors at the cell. At least that's my view. Um, because uh, I am principally leading us through this uh, discovery, you're going to get principally my view. Uh, you, well, you, will have, you will have principally my view in this course so far, though of course we've had more and more uh, of um, uh, ad, uh, advanced instructors um, come on of late, and that's been wonderful. So um, when they want to offer their view, they, they are. So that's great. But it's important to remember that, you know, my view, our, our view is merely one of many. And we don't want you believing something is so about the manuscript just because we said it. We want to convince you to be convinced by the same evidence that persuades us. Right, that's scholarship. Uh, and so, without further ado, um, as a reminder, if you have any questions at all uh, going through this uh, this session today, please do ask them. Um, there's no dumb questions, and chances are, if you have a question, five other people have it too. So please do do ask. Does anybody have any questions or comments about anything that we looked at in our previous session before we start? No? Okay. Great. So, um, let's situate ourselves again in your manuscript. We are um, pro nearing probably 60% of the way through the manuscript, maybe just over 50. Um, for the last number of weeks, we've been walking carefully through the sword in two hands section, which ends approximately at 31, uh, folio 31 RAB, which we'll get to today. Um, in the stored in uh, two hands section, um, at least how I uh, read it. It's in five or six parts. One part of the guards with a set of six guards plus the LaDonna, uh, the double LaDonna image, and then the set of 12 guards with the red labeling. Then we have the cuts, then we have a little preface, and then we have the Largo section, the Strato section, and then finally a um, Boar's Tooth Master, which we'll finally get to today. Uh, last week, I believe, we um, more or less finished our uh, study of the Stretto section. So I just want to quickly pause at the at the end of the Stretto section where we looked at one, two, three, four disarms. Does anybody have any questions or comments about these disarms? before we continue. I'm not sure if we rushed it last time. I don't really remember. So I want to make sure that there's nothing else lagging here. No. Okay. If we do, then we'll just return to it uh, 
afterwards okay so um yeah okay so great so we finished the largo section we finished the strato section my god can't believe it um combining both the largo and strato sections i won't bore you with another review but basically looking at both of these sections we saw we've seen a significant amount of material some new stuff though much of what we saw was something at least similar to what we've seen in the Abrazari sections and the dagger sections. So lots of stuff we've rec we recognize, lots of new stuff, um, very all told very interesting. And uh, critically, to remember that these the Largo section and the Strato section seem to be divided, not only by image but by text. So we know the two separate things. And they seem to be divided in some way by concept. So Fiore is uh, with this Largo and Stretto, Fiore is attempting to show not so much per se in the position, although of course arguably that's part of it, that there's two main parts of fighting with the sword here. One part, which he calls uh, Azogo Largo, which has Largo characteristics, and another part, Stretto, which has these strato characteristics and combining both of these this you know gives us something of a holistic view of what we're in store for when we're fighting with the sword in two hands specifically um now let me just close uh, go away. so now we have the boris Toothmaster, right and the reason why i'm i you know, i went back over these again is because the first thing we see once we leave the strato section is we see another master with with three three uh i suppose and so the obvious question we're going to have to ask right away and we're going to get to it now is <laughs> where does this master belong right he's not in largo he's not in strato he's afterwards so um let's just get right into it we're kind of going to start off with a bit of a bit of a mystery, at least at first. So, folio 31 RAB in the Getty. Uh, Alex, sir, would you like to read the text for us today? Oh, that's too big. There. These three want to kill this master, who is waiting with a two-handed sword. The first is about to throw his sword at the master. The second is about to strike him with a cut or a thrust. The third is about to throw two spears, which he is ready to do as illustrated. I am waiting for these three in this guard, Dente de Chingado. I could wait in other guards as well, like Left Posa de Dona or Left Posa de Finestra, and still be able to defend as I would from Dente de Chingado. Each of these guards use, uh, use the defense, use this defense. I'll wait for my opponents, one by one, without fear of failure, and from any cut, thrust, or handheld weapon thrown up at me. I'll perform an acrescimento with my leading right foot, pass obliquely against the opponent's weapon, and beat it to his left side. After making my parry, I'll instantly attack. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, so... Um, here we go, this third master. And he's being attacked by three people. Someone who has two spears he's going to throw. Um, someone who is going to throw his sword. And, yep, yeah. and uh, this. Again, from, what's this thing called again? What's like this? Uh, what thing? Uh, like like this current move, like uh, the folio number I see, but can you scroll up a bit? I just missed it. Oh well, so oh, uh, I, I have called it. So whenever whenever we're dealing with, um, whenever we're dealing with the the title of whatever page we're looking at, that is something that I have done. So, um, very rarely does Fiori actually name you know, posters or play, you know, uh, name things like this. I've called it the Boar's Tooth Master. That is not its official name. That appears nowhere in the text. That's my way of describing it if I had to give a name. The best and most accurate name for this play is Folio 31 RAB. <laughs> so um, so that's what this is, right? Um, but um, yeah, I call it the Boar's Tooth Master. Um, so yeah, all right. So let's look at the text again so here we go we got this guy against two instances of thrown objects one sword two spears and then against a cutter thrust 
which is, you know, I, I guess in concept, a simple attack by the sword, right? Because the attacks are going to be either thrusts or cuts. So, okay, great. So he's got three opponents. We've seen opponents like this in the sword and one hand section. So this three opponent business is not new. This is the second time we've seen this. And um, here we got the um, master of the sword in one hand dealing with a cut, a thrust, and a thrown sword. So similar situation. Um, and similar sass, this master says he can deal with it. He doesn't care. So what's the deal with this one? Um, I will. I, I am waiting for these three in this guard, Dente teaching Garo. Okay. So there's something special about Dente teaching Garo, do you say? Well, you know, I could wait in other guards as well, like, uh, I don't know, left post of Didano, or, uh, I don't know, post of Di Finestra, left post of Di Finestra, and still be able to defend as I would from Dente teaching Garo. All these guards use this defense. Okay, wait, hold on a second. So what you're saying, Fiore, is you're saying that, yes, you're waiting here in the image, and Borsu's on the left, but you could also do what you're about to describe from other posta on the left. Okay, I kind of follow, but then the posters you suggest are posters that are high, not low. Wow, okay. So this seems to be, at face value, Fiore seems to be saying that these three posts on the left, as an example, are sufficient to reliably do the defense that he's about to describe. So as a, as a side note for the scholars here, this is another example of an interesting possible data point that's showing the same cut being made from multiple posta, right? Where the starting posta may be irrelevant. But anyways, we see that the three things that they have in common are that they're on the left. Okay, so fine. So what is his defense that he says? I'll wait for them one by one without fear of failure from any cut, thrust, or handheld up and thrown at me. Yeah, yeah. What are we doing? I'll advance the right foot, <clears throat> which is the front foot, off the line. Wow, so you can't mistake that. Even if we didn't have text uh, a picture, we would know, right? Okay, so the right foot's leading, it's in front. I'll advance it off the line and pass at an angle against the opponent's weapon and beat it to his left side. Beat it to his left side. Beat it to his left side. Okay. And then instantly attack. So, um, pass off the line, though this is the lead foot, no, I was going to say something that is, no, let me walk that back. It's not obvious by what he means by pass off the line. It could be pass off to the right, it could be pass off to the left, there are different views. But because Fiore says that he beats the sword, or he beats the object to the left, my my understanding is that the conventional interpretation of this play is that the pass offline is to the left, not to the right. But maybe this is getting too far into the weeds. There's a pass offline by the lead foot. An in, a, sorry, there's an increase offline, an increase offline by the lead foot, and then a pass with the parry. So uh, as far as that goes, it's actually not really very mystical or you know, super weird. That's something that we're all familiar with to some degree, especially from Borst II, the low posta. Those, um, you know, rising parries are pretty, you know, pretty standard by now to us. I mean, we even saw them with the sword in one hand. That was our bread and butter, right? So in a sense, this isn't really anything shocking or, or new or interesting. But he's very specific about it. He's very specific about the footwork and more more curiously he's put it after the sword and two hands section right he's put it after everything now it's not obvious why this is it could be for any number of reasons who knows right but 
we've seen Fury emphasize things before, right? In his own little way. It's possible that maybe he's placed this here because he thinks it's great. Right? And he's gone to specialty, you know, he's gone the extra mile to point out, even though we talked about Boar's Tooth before in the post section, he's, and he's talked about parries from below in the sword in one hand section, such that none of this is actually new. He's gone to a specific point of drawing our attention to this situation. And um, especially the the fact that this, str this strategy can be employed not only by Boar's Tooth, on the left, but also possibly by some other posts on the left as well. Left LaDonna, left Finestra. You know, theoretically and conceivably with um, left tail, maybe middle iron gate, you know. But all in all, even though it's not super, super, I don't know, it's not super unique, very interesting. Very interesting that Fiore goes to makes a point of saying this and makes a point of not placing it in Largo or Stretto, having it follow after. Um, but uh, him being very confident about it and, and uh, yeah, and saying some interesting things. So um, I think that's all I want to spend time on this one. Does anybody uh, have any other things to add there or any questions? No? Awesome. All righty. Can you go on the text just for one quick second? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, that concludes our exploration of the sword in two hands section. It has been many weeks, um, but we've definitely taken our... Um, We've given it the time it requires, I'm sure. Um, we've got a great look at all of it, and um, yeah, I really hope we we did it justice. Although I'm sure we uh, I'm sure we did. Um, so um, I guess do we really have anything else to say about the sword and two hand section? Um, for recruits, and this back to the um, South Study session is principally kind of targeted towards that that audience. Um, in terms of the like the depth and complexity of where we're going, it's in, initially it's less per se important for your picking up the art to get hyper focused on how to do the moves, you know, as it were. And uh, you know, this the sword in one hand section or the sword in two hand section gets a lot of attention in our curriculum, not least because you know when you're getting a new person into the cell, usually. It's the sword and it's the sword stuff that's the sexiest. They're not really interested in grappling or dagger or whatever. They want to pick up an actual metal sword and learn how to use it. That's amazing. So not only is it is it um, really attractive, but it gets students' attention. But just like with grappling and dagger, what's important about the sword to study is not about the moves. It's about the principles and the soft skills, as it were, that you pick up as a consequence of studying uh, the martial art through these plays and through these actions. And it's the, the mastery of those soft skills, along with, incidentally, a knowledge of the plays that's going to really help you improve and get you to a place, uh, get you to a more advanced place when you, when you begin. So um, the, the message of hope in that little narrative is specifically that when you start, you're going to suck at all of this stuff and you're going to suck at it for a long time. And if you, if you make the mistake of thinking that your, you know, the indication of your progress in the art is how well you can do some of these plays, you're wrong. That's the, that's not a sufficient indication of your, your education. It's this slow buildup of soft skills that you're slowly packing internally. Every day you come to the salle, you're doing these post drills and you're doing the first play along sort of whatever. You're packing in to your subconscious those internal skills so that they're going to come out without thinking about them. And that's that's when excellence is really showing. And so if you feel like you're, you know, sometimes your plays aren't really going well or you're messing something up or whatever, don't self-discourage. 
right? Just let it go, right? And, and, and note that as a data point in your journey, right? And same goes, of course, for wrestling and for dagger as well. All right, so let's close the sword and two hands section. Wow, that seems crazy to do, but here we go. We are moving forward. So what's next? Oh man, the mixed weapons section, which I've called here dagger and spear and clubs, which is really uh, unimaginative because that's what it actually is. <laughs> um, so, all right, so we finished the sword and two hands section and now we've got this thing. Um, this is another place in the manuscript that I would call or view as something transitionary. So I would say the baston cello section, the sword and dagger, the dagger and sword section, and the dagger, spear, and club section function as some transitionary places between the what I see as the more main subjects of uh, Abrazare, dagger, and swordsmanship. Um, so in that sense, um, because we've seen this let's just say a pattern. I don't know if two is a pattern, but we've seen transitionary sections before. And we've noted that, you know, calling them transitionary isn't really arbitrary. It's, they, it, it definitely makes a lot of sense. It's not surprising per se to have another transitionary section here, even though on the face of it, this section looks a little bizarre, right? It seems a little bit of out of the ordinary, right? Um, but here we are, okay? So there's really not much else to say but the context of this. Um, let's just get into it and let's see what we're dealing with here. All right. So the first master of a dagger and spear or staff or whatever. I'm not sure if he specifies if it's a spear in the text. I'll have to see. Um, all right. This is folio 31R C and D in the Getty. And uh, who is the next victim? Uh, Andrew, sir, would you like to read the text for us? Okay. <clears throat> this master waits for these two opponents who are armed with lances. The first is about to attack with an overhand thrust, the other underhand, which the master can plainly see. The master waits with a staff and the dagger. When the attack comes, he angles his staff to the right, almost into terra to the port of Pharaoh. Tuning his whole, turning his whole body, but without moving his feet or his staff from the ground. And the master remains in guard. And as uh, one of the opponents attacks, the master parries with his staff, and if needed, with a dagger towards the left. And with that, the defense, and with that defense, he passes forward and strikes. And this is his defense, as you will find after these two with the lances. Were we both ready to strike this master? So, sorry, we were both ready to strike this master, but as he said, we can't do him any harm. That is, unless we deceive him by turning the lance around and attack him with the heel of the lance. And if he parries the heel strike, we then turn our lances again and strike him with the iron. This will be the counter. All right, thank you very much, An uh, Andrew. So these guys are um, <laughs> these guys are a little smarter than the usual uh, knuckleheads that we've seen in these kind of double and and, and triple uh, uh, plays. Um, so they have a counter baked in, which is really interesting. Are we going to see that counter? No, uh, not here anyway. Not here. We're going to have to hold our interest until the spear section, and maybe we'll see something like what they describe. But okay, so um, so I posted a video. Um, I think I posted it on the Facebook page. Um, this is a very mercifully short video from my Free Scholar presentation. <laughs> so hopefully it won't it won't burden you. Um, but uh, let's just skip to it, and uh, I'll turn the sound off. So this is um, this is what we're we're looking at here. Um, so we see the hand the hand in tuta porta di ferro, right? Rather than the spear, I don't believe that's what he that's what he means, like like 
putting the spear, or let's say point or the, the staff, you know, something like point down or like something like that. That's not what he means. He's clearly holding the staff upright, but he's, um, uh, so from up from the upright position, he's purposely brought his hand low, right? He's brought his hand from the upright position. He's brought it to there, you see. And this function, uh, uh, classically, this function is for provocative reasons. So if, this, if the staff is upright, lead foot, right, staff is in front, held straight up, then there really isn't much of the scholar on the left side of the staff. Right, and especially not not necessarily enough for an enemy with a spear. So this position invites the attack on the inside, right? And now we're starting to see some of the logic that we're going to end up seeing in the spear. We're starting to see things um, instead of this um, this this uh, quartered. Uh, this quartered situation we were dealing with with the long sword, where we had, you know, the upper quadrant, the you know, upper left and right, the lower left and right. Here, when we have these larger weapons with spear, we're often talking about something which seems a little simpler. Mathematically, it's simpler, although it's actually much, much more difficult. We have something like an, an, an opening in the middle uh, or on your inside, right, between your shoulder blades and an opening to your outside. So what Fiori seems to be suggesting here is that if you're facing down these two people, right? Um, you can provocate your shoulder in order to receive the the strike, the 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 the, the thrust with the spear to your outside, right? Or to the left of the spear, because of course the action of the spear is going to be to, um, you know, resume its original position, right? It's going to be to go upright again and in the act of going upright it opens that door for the passing step and entry and once you're inside with the dagger then you can go to work right so um, this appears to be what fury is getting at the f the purpose of the two figures classically is to show that this works against not only a spear that's being um, you know thrust overhand but also underhand and uh, he's also showing what seems pretty clearly in the text to be a provocation, right? Something provocative. But of course, we've seen this many times before. We've seen lots of provocative posta um, and, and having that provocation set up a good response. So, um, yeah, um, that's, that's, that's really it. That's really what's going on here. Um, but of course, the counters, right? So um, it's great that Fury is already talking about the counters because this is a this is a natural question that we we should have is that really it for the spearman that you know once this parry is made is that you know is that is that really it for them and of course it isn't right of course it isn't uh, though actually in this particular instance you see Ariel is kind of couching the spear um, which kind of limits a bit her her next response but um that's not necessarily needed right and the response that he suggests is to come in with the butt if the spear uh, point is is parried away and that's a very common second response in spear as we will come to see but it's also a very dangerous one a very good one um it's very good for the the spearman to come in with the, with the butt so uh, though this seems like a pretty slick little play it's, uh, I don't think it is. I actually think it's pretty desperate. It's a pretty desperate situation um, in this case. You can definitely handle it, but it's not like, you know, you're going to do this one parry. You're going to force them to attack you. You're going to do this one parry, and then it's all going to be golden because you're going to have stepped in on them with a the dagger, and you're going to start sewing away, right? Not quite. That spear is pretty terrifying. But a neat little play. Very cool. Uh, all right. Any questions about that one? Oh, I don't know why I got rid of the video. Um, I'm going to just get it again. Okay, let's move on. 
to the next one. Okay, so this is the finish of the play, uh, play before, I think, but let's just read the text to make sure. Um, who's the next? BD, would you like to read the text for us, please? This is Folio 31VA in the Getty. This is the play of the master who waits for the two opponents with lances. The master has a dagger in his right hand and the staff in his left, straight in front of him. He can perform this play, which I'll show you in his stead. But if the opponent had known his stuff, he could have defended against the thrust. He could have widened his grip on the lance, and with the part of the lance protruding past his back hand, he would have parried under my dagger, i.e. by crossing, and this wouldn't have happened to him. Had he known this counter, he then could have messed me up pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, oh shit all right so so we get even more information about the counter um we do see the finish of the play he was describing but we get some awesome description of this counter the spear butt coming under the hand and you know if he had known the counter he could have messed me up pretty bad so he says now i hope for the most more astute of you you will have um immediately thought well this isn't new at all we've seen this We've seen this before. We saw this before in this dagger and sword section. We saw this uh, here, right? And here, right? Well, this one we thought maybe it might come over, but uh, certainly here, right? Coming up under the dagger with the with the with the sheath, right? And in this case, he's bopping him in the in the in the snoot with the sheath, and then you know whatever but we've definitely seen this before but with a sword so hey there's more data points for us that this is a kind of a holistic system fury's not trying to make too much new shit up right we already know how to defend this we're going to use the butt of the spear just like we use the sword against daggers before right use the longer weapon against the short and since the spear can turn around that point of contact and it's only a single point of contact we're good to go so lots of opportunity for the um, spear person to react um, and to to uh, manage this situation um, and yeah i'm not sure what else there's to say um yeah that's that's pretty much it we've seen this before makes sense very cool to see that uh we're still we're still operating with what we've uh what we started with all right next one the clubs play one of my favorites folio 31 vb uh bruce sir would you like to read the text for us all right this master makes his defense with these two clubs against the lance as the man with the lance closes to attack the master throws the club to the opponent's head with his right hand and he immediately uses the other club to parry the attack, striking the opponent in the chest with the dagger, as I'm about to show. <laughs> what the fuck? This is one of the most chaotic and hilarious plays of the book. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's some pole like the, the Polax chain play is, is pretty slapstick as well, pretty wild. But this one is definitely takes the takes the cake for me, too. It's pretty, pretty bizarre. And, um, you know, because Ariella was so nice, um, <laughs> she she let me do this to her at our, my free scholar test, and it, it was fun. So let's uh, let's watch it. Uh, yeah. Uh, wild. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. That's the the kind of idea, right? Although you see in the um, in the video, I threw the, I made the parry first. I was a little more conservative, I suppose, than than the text. But we were pretty close. That that this arena was really small. Um, so maybe if you had a little more space, you throw it first. Huck it at his head. But yeah, so there you go, right? If you have you have two clubs, this is something that you can do. Now you know. To take it a little more seriously, let's also ask some questions from ourselves. Um, okay, so you have two clubs, 
is this the main thing that you should do, right? Is this the best thing that you should do? Well, hold on a minute, right? From this situation with two clubs and with the staff and the dagger, there is no discussion about the broad principles or contexts per se of this weapon set, of this situation, right? Um, we have a, a good idea of what we're dealing with, you know, but he doesn't really lay it out per se, um, not in, a, in the same way he does elsewhere. So we have to use our brains and put two and two together and lean on what we know. Um, and so with these two clubs, right, we, our common sense tells us that two clubs are a thing that's as old as, as man has been on this, on this earth. Um, there's lots of things that you can do with two weapons, right? And this particular play here doesn't exclude any of those things, though, of course, Fiori doesn't show them. But we ought not read this, I contend, as Fiori making some sort of positive judgment about what is best to do with two clubs, period. Right? He's showing this neat little play. It definitely works against the spear, though there are more conservative things. There are more conventional things one might decide to do with two clubs. But Fury doesn't really talk about it, so we'll have to, you know, we have to speculate based on our understanding. Yeah, because right. the Dog Brothers hadn't been invented yet. That's right. That's that's right. Yeah, as if the Dog Brothers were the first ones to pick up clubs and beat the shit out of each other. Um, so yeah, so you know, uh, all the things that we know, we should apply, right? And now, you know, just from looking at this image, we should notice that there isn't anything new here, right? None of this is new. This club is in LaDonna. This club is in Tail, right? Although because this club is being wielded by the left hand, this poster most resembles left tail, right? In in, in its in its uh, structure, right? But this stuff is exactly what we know. And so there's nothing here that is actually new to us. This spear is in Finestra, but I mean, it doesn't really matter, does it, right? So even though we've picked up two things that we've never even talked about before without any introduction whatsoever, we pretty much know exactly what's going on. At this point in the book, we have enough to go back onto that we ought not feel like this is really super crazy or weird. It's applying stuff we already know to a situation which on the face of it seems unique but really isn't. It's really actually kind of boring. Other than the fact, of course, that he advocates throwing something at their head, which is kind of fun. That's awesome. Um, yeah, my, the only other thing to say about this one, I think, is that you do a disservice to your fellow uh, members of your sal if you, when you train this, use anything but wood. <laughs> it just lacks the lack. You need a you need a thud. You need a thud on their fencing mask to really get it. If you use that something foam or whatever, it's just not really going to have the same feeling. Um, anyway, <laughs> and Ariella was fine, uh, I think. All right, so let's uh, let's deal with the last one, Folio 31 VC. Um, here we have the finish of the previous play. Uh, Connor, would you like to read this one for us, please? And thank you. I do. He said, "Your stuff be trouble and ants on." Hey Connor, sorry. Then, so I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you um, uh, you're cutting out just a little bit. Could you try that again? How do I sound? One. Good three. now. I do what the master me said. You had known your stuff could have given me trouble by lifting your hands, your lance under my dagger, and then could have really messed me. So take this, since you didn't know what to. Do. <laughs> No mercy, right? So, okay, so there again we see the same admonishment to the counter that we saw before and before that and before that. If the uh, Zugadori had known what to do, he could have defended it and not been humiliated and die. But he didn't, so he's humiliated and dead. That's it. Take that, idiot. And that that's all Fury has to say. Take that, idiot. You didn't know what to do. Meh. And that concludes our mixed weapons section. 
So all in all, it is a bit of an odd thing, but let's let's take some things seriously. First of all, we see the consistent use of a staff or a spear in all of these plays, number one. Number two, we see the obvious usage of sidedness, which is going to become very important um, in uh, the sections that follow. Sword in two hands, poleaxe and spear, sidedness is going to become a critical element of understanding what we're doing. Um, third, we see that um, we see more evidence that we haven't left previous sections behind. Essentially, the counters to all of these things have been uh, what we already saw in the sword in the dagger and sword section, with that that long weapon being lifted underneath the dagger, doing the parry that we've already seen with the sword and the sheath. So the counter the counter wasn't new. Um, and um, yeah, so very cool, very very neat little section. Um, I don't want to say too much more about it, but I really do think that this is a neat little random example of where a Fiore student can take the you know the knowledge that they've gained from the first half of the book, which is relatively speaking in a fairly structured, you know, decently articulated and organized way, and apply it to something that seems on the face of it extremely strange. And it, it ought to give us confidence that though this seems to be kind of plucked in from, uh, from plucked out from nowhere, that a lot of this is familiar, regardless, right? And that's that's one of the things that um, you start to notice as you get more and more experienced in martial arts. You know, like uh, when you really start to un when you have a when you have a robust framework of human movement and the different attacks and threats that you can you know, that you can receive, you can go to something like a throwdown or some random, you know, martial arts situation, fence, you know, uh, tournament or whatever, and you can see people doing things and all of what they're doing, regardless of how weird perhaps it might look, it all fits into your system, right? There's nothing, there's nothing that people are doing that's outside of your system where you can't even account for it, right? People are just doing things and you know, you, you have an idea of what everybody's doing, where they're going, and an idea of maybe how to respond, right? And that's really great. It shows that the system's working. One system. more thing. Mm -hmm. For people outside of the Fiorist community who argue that Fiori just teaches dueling, like, you know, formal duels. Right. And informal duels. Point at this section. Yeah. This is self-defense. Yeah. So when you're on traveling or whatever on the road or or, you know, like you're in some some place that you don't normally go and you're just going to get there. Um, this is the kind of thing you're going to run into pretty frequently. So being able to use whatever's at hand. I mean, if he didn't mm. have sticks, he could do this with um, his dagger, a hat. He could pick up a, yep. a bucket and use it in his left hand, anything yep. at all. It's a concept. So yep. anybody that ever says to you in your journey as a Fiorist, oh, Fiori's only about dueling, you just point this out to them and show them that they really haven't got a clue what they're talking about and they really should learn to read a book. <laughs> point and blink slowly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. <clears throat> so, done and done. That is, that is this section. Um, we'll just click through that. So now we're on to the Senyo page. <sighs> All right. And yes, I definitely think we should, we'll probably be able to get through this today. So, um, awesome. All right. Let's take a look at the Senyo. This is one of the most important images in the book for all Fiori students. It's the image that has the, the single most prominence in um, the Emma Toronto cell uh, was ever since I first set foot in the place and that never changed um it's critical to understand and it serves a an absolutely foundational part of our art and our experience at, at emma and so we're let's take a good look at it today and i i just thinking about it i can't wait to see that banner hung back up on the south man oh, i can smell it it's so close all right folio 32 r 
in the Getty, 32R. Um, Graham, would you like to read the text for us, sir? Sure. This master's seven swords represent the seven sword strikes. The four animals represent four virtues, caution, speed, strength, and courage. If you want to excel in this art, you must possess these virtues. No creature can see better than me, the lynx, and this virtue puts everything in its right place and measure. Caution. I, the tiger, am so quick at running and turning I can't even be overtaken by a lightning bolt. Speed. I am the lion. Nobody carries a more courageous heart. I offer every one battle. Courage. I am the elephant who carries a castle as freight. I never kneel or lose my stride. Strength. Thank you very much, Graham. Okay, so before we begin, let's take a look at all of the senyos. So um, first we'll um, let's check the Getty and then the PD and then the Paris. All right. So here we've got the Getty. Um, we have that little prefatory text there, and then we have the four four explanatory pieces with the four animals and the seven swords. Prudentia, audacia, fortitudo, and aceleritas. Although the, the words here um, uh, are different. In, I think they're, this is more they're more Italian. Uh, or, yeah, they're, they're Italian because, of course, prudentia, audacia, uh, fortitudo, and celeritas are, is Latin. Um, what is the word for? Uh, avisamento. Okay. Avisamento. Presteza, ardimento, and forteza in Italian are these words here in the Getty that we see. Um, though, of course, we you know, we usually go by the words in the PD, I believe. Indeed. So here is the PD, um, and let's uh, I'll read the text for the PD as well, so we get a little uh, comparison. We are the four animals with these features. Whoever wants to fence makes comparisons to us, and whoever will have a good portion of our virtues. We'll have honor and weapons, uh, uh, as says the art. The lynx. No creature sees better than me, the lynx. I always set things in order with a compass and measure. Prudentia. I, the tiger, am so swift uh, 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 to run and to wheel that even the bolt from the sky cannot overtake me. Why didn't you just say lightning? Um, <laughs> none carries... Yeah, I know, I know. Because None carries a more ardent heart than me, the lion, but to everyone I make an invitation to battle. Audacia. I am the elephant, and I carry a castle as cargo. I do not kneel nor lose my footing. Fortitudo. And here is the PD image. Much bigger animals. Um, the, uh, the art's a little better too for my money I like this one kind Actually, of more this is this is yeah. the senior page that uh, Lil had pointed for yeah it's uh that's she right that's the big one and yeah. she also included the spelling mistakes that are on this page oh yeah <laughs> yeah this is a nice wrong, one right? yes it was it's a very nice one uh, it's a very nice one the the lynx the lion the elephant and the uh tiger. and the tiger and also notice that all of the animals have this, have the garter, have the wall, the golden band. I say it's a garter. I don't know. I don't know if there's a more technical term for this, but a it's collar. a collar. Oh, there you go. I have a golden collar, but it's similar to the golden garter, of course. That's the uh, um, the uh, imp implication, I suppose. And then last but not least, we have the um, Paris. So I'll read the text um, forgive the translation. Behold, we are four distinguished animals with these traits who, for instance, um, uh, strongly reminds that he is able in arms. He who wants to be clear or bright and uh, a shining, what the hell? He wants to be clear and bright and even shining brightly with honesty. Okay, we get the point. Um, prudence, everything born under the sky will be discerned with my eyes, the lynx. I conquer by measurement whatever it pleases me to attempt. He undertakes the lessons for himself and determines which are for harming. Impress the evidence made known upon your spirit. Thenceforth, that evidence of arms will have been taught 
before among friends. That's so brutal. But we get the point. Um, everything born under the sky will be discerned with my eyes the links. Remember that one. Quickness. I am quick in the hunt and roll the, the quick ones back in their orbit. Probably with lightning. Nor in my running will the lightning overcome the tiger. Okay, there you go. We get the point. Courage. I am the um, quadruped, which is the elephant, the strong crown, my brave things. For instance, are the foundation of every axis. Oh, it's the lion. Now conquers the lion of the heart. Therefore, we call whomsoever to arms. Oof. Okay, that's pretty brutal. And then the strength, uh, the fortitude has the text cut off. Okay. So okay. here, here is the Paris image. We hear more for the image anyway. Um, we see we have images that are similar to the PD. Um, it's not a bad image. It's a little unfortunately smudged, which is too bad. Somebody obviously spilled wine on it, those bastards. Uh, or water, it looks water damage. But we have the lynx with the calipers, we have the lion with the heart, the elephant with the castle, and the tiger with the arrow in its paw, along with the seven swords. All right, so let's return to the Getty. Let's do the PD. Screw it. I like this one. <clears throat> Aaron. Yes, sir. Uh, just a comment. He has mm -hmm. the Lynx, and the Lynx is using a compass as measuring tool. <clears throat> if you want a very good uh, dissertation on how to use the compass as a measuring tool, mm -hmm. there's a really fascinating book called By Hand and Eye, mm -hmm. which discusses exactly the kind of concepts that he would be familiar with and why they, they would be a measuring, that's a measuring tool. Is it more intended to be nautical in commentary or is it uh, more like uh, non-nautical? No, it's actually, it's actually a tool used mm -hmm. to lay out designs, measure designs, uh, angles. Mm -hmm. You can measure angles with it. You can measure distances with it. You can measure uh, in mm -hmm. um, woodworking. Right. Yeah, it is a very common tool, yeah. And also yes. Also graphics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, um, and you can get some very accurate. You can get do very accurate work with with the uh, with that for layout. So it, that's why he's using that as an intellectual skill for measuring and and seeing the ground. I guess. I'll have called... to look up that book. Yeah, that's all those medieval churches with you know their arches and their Gothic architecture. They were all done with one of these. It's by, by the hand in the eye. Yeah. Excellent book. Um, awesome. Okay, I put it in the chat. By the hand and the eye. Awesome. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, all right. So, so um, let's let's first cross something off the list. So the seven swords. All right. Um, the seven swords are um, conventionally interpreted to display the seven, the six cuts in the thrust. Right, two Fendente from either side, two Mezzano from either side, two Sultani from either side, and a thrust. Okay. Um, I submit to you that they this segno does not present an authoritative image on the angles and paths of the cuts, at least how Fiori intends to describe them in the text of the manuscript. The ones that do are the actual folio with the cuts in in the Getty. They describe the angle, right? Teeth and knees, knees to teeth, etc. And the images reflect that. So we don't want to go to the Senyo to notice the angles of cuts, right? Not least because, you know, the PD has a more proportional image. The Getty one isn't proportional at all, right? We would hate, you know, You'd hate to be caught believing that this is these are angles of, of the cuts, at least the ones that Fury describes earlier, right? Surely that cannot be so. However, it ought to be um, on the angles of cuts, right? We ought to reflect that the only cuts that exist are not the one, just the ones that Fury mentioned, right? So it's not the case that, um, you know, we should necessarily believe that the only cuts Fiore wants us to ever do are the ones that he mentions earlier in the Getty. 
right? Obviously, <laughs> there are as many cuts that exist as are possible to perform, right? And there are 360 degrees, right, in this circle, there are 360 different angles of cuts that one could make, right? Um, later in uh, in later fencing and manuscripts, these cuts, these angles here, the shoulder to hip angles, they're going to be called certain things by later masters. Specifically in, in the Bolognese swordsmanship that we study, we see this angle as specifically identified as a squalimbro angle, as um, unique uh, to the fendenti angle, which is more vertical. Which is kind of what Fiore in in the, in the text of the cuts. That's what that that shows from teeth and knees. It's a much more vertical cut rather than this shoulder to hip stuff. The mezzanos are less controversial because, of course, um, they can go from neck to knee. So having them in the middle of the body here is not you know fine. That's fine, right? But um, this is just across these cuts off the list. It's less to show you the angles of cuts as on a target or whatever, and more to have them in here, right? Here's the man, the master, maybe. Here are the seven cuts and the thrust, and the art is arrayed around him. It's the art of the sword. We kind of got everything in under one page, uh, under one roof, everything on the same page, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that kind of moves us into our next topic, and that is what the hell is this, and how do we think about it? How might we think about it? So there is there are legions of ink spilled on this image, all sorts of really interesting and fun ideas about what each of these figures mean. What should we take from this? You know, how is it important, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we're not going to go into all of that tonight, not least because I don't know it all, not enough to, to tell you. Um, tonight, I'm just going to give you one one potential view and uh, uh, who else is here and Kel um, if of course you have anything to add on this please do um, this is a super important uh, part of our study here and uh, uh, now in, since you're here it'd be good to have your view as well um, but okay so let me let me give you one way to think about this page and I want to give you this view because I want to attempt to make this page practical I want to kind of demystify whatever seems to be going on here. At least present one potential interpretation of this page in so something that you can take to the south floor, right? Something you can take onto the lists and have it affect your fencing, have it affect your play um, in a much more practical, immediately practical way than per se um, reflecting on the more sort of intellectual aspects of um, these uh, these four images here, these these ideas. So prudentia, audacia, fortitudo, and celeritas. So what the hell is going on here? Um, here's one way to think about it. So it seems as if prudentia and fortitudo and celeritas and audacia are two pairs. Okay, they're two pairs of things. They have an individual identity but they also have an identity in relationship to their pair. Okay, so we'll start off by examining their identity first, and then I'll, I'll suggest how they might relate. So Prudentia. Prudentia, um, the lynx holds a pair of calipers, all right? Um, medieval people believed that, uh, some medieval people, of course, and some legends and myths, etc., etc., believed that this lynx creature had the power to see the future. And through this instrument, this these calipers, an instrument of measurement, um, this concept may be trying to suggest for us, placed at the head of the figure, what it means or the image of understanding the art personified knowing your plays right the actual you know countable knowledge that you might have about Armitzare, right what are the eight you know um what are the eight things of, uh parts of wrestling that fiora wants you to do what are the what are the four masters of dagger 
How many how many scholars in the six master of dagger? How many keys are there? When would you do which key when? Based on what pressure? When is it good to spring forward? When is it good to um, go back? Right? There's all sorts of theoretical and technical questions about the practicalities of the art. Right? Thinking about the pressures um, in, in 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 dagger, stay, push forward, pull back. Can you tell what those are? Right? Um, looking at the difference between Largo and Stretto. What makes something Largo? How do you know when you're there? That seems really important. What makes Stretto? How do you know when you're there? Right? And knowing the difference. Right? All this stuff that we've been, you know, all this stuff we've been looking at, a lot of the stuff we've been studying up until this point, 20 weeks in, a good chunk of it is, is involved in Prudentia. Right? Knowing the art, what can I do and what can the enemy do to me? Right? Prudentia. What can I do and what can the enemy do to me? Audacia. Um, Audacia, you know, in a way it's pretty simple, right? Bravery, courage, right? Willingness to be there in the fight. But it's not simple, is it? Right? Um, at least at a surface level, audacia is going to mean for, for us not just courage, you know, not just lack of fear or whatever. It's going to mean a confidence, right? It's going to mean a con, you know, a confidence to know that your art will win, right? To know that in the moment you're staring across somebody who's going to kill you. The swords are sharp. The fight is real. If you fuck up, you're going to die. But you're not afraid about fucking up because you're going to pull through. You're going to win. You're going to persevere no matter what. You have no, you have no doubt in your mind. You have no doubt in your art. You have no fear or doubt in your heart. You have full, you know, trust, belief, courage in the things you've learned. And that if you do your art, if you do what you know, you will survive. You will make your defenses, right? And you'll persevere. Um, you know, the things we can say about the lion, right? The confidence that a lion has um, in himself and, and, you know, in his power. This is sort of on the surface, at least, what we're looking at with Audacia. But we're going to learn more about it when we look at it in um, in comparison or in, in a pair. Fortitudo. Um, again, um, so Furious is a, something really interesting in the different manuscripts. This, uh, you know, strength, right? Yes, it's an elephant. He's carrying a castle on his back. Stability. He never kneels or loses his stride, right? There's no example in the in Fury of Fury going to the ground. And while this could be very well, it could be circumstantial. It's still the case that there's no play in in Fury nor mention in the text of any play that going to the ground. The only thing from the ground he ever mentions is in that leg shot play in the sword, in the Largo section where he says, if you were on the ground, and you, maybe you could hit at his ankle, but never strike at his leg lower than the knee otherwise, right? That's the only mention that he ever makes of being on the ground. So conventionally, what we understand this from, from this elephant, right? is that like the uh, creature with no knees, we will not kneel or lose our stride. We always strive to keep our balance upright and not to give away our, 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 our fortitude, our stability, not to give it away for the sake of an advantage, a victory. We have a stability that is uncompromising, right? will maintain it at all costs. Um, all costs meaning uh, even if it means uh, foregoing 
uh, and attempts to kill an enemy. Um, Fiore thinks this is super critical, that the stability and the strength of our posture and our position is, is critical to the art. And we're going to see why when we look at it in comparison. And lastly, we have Celeritas. We have the tiger. Um, conventionally, you know, we have a sense of what this means. Speed, okay. Well, you know, great martial artists are quick. Okay, that makes sense, I guess. Everybody who's really good at martial arts seems to move really fast. And, you know, a master in martial arts could, you know, maybe pluck an arrow from the sky or something like that. Yeah, sure, why not? You know, we, we, we see lots of examples of martial arts masters and people who seem super skilled. And one of the common images of this skill, one of the common, you know, things we, we that we notice as someone who isn't skilled in martial arts, right? Someone who is watching, we notice speed, right? These guys seem to move so fast, you know. Not necessarily fat, you know, a lot, but you could have somebody super silent, super quiet, right? Like, um, you know, uh, you guys, I'm, I'm sure you guys have all seen uh, the the uh, a Mifune, uh samurai movies, uh, Yojimbo and Senjuro. You know what I mean? Um, that one, that one scene where, uh, uh, where's that? Was the let's let's pull that up. Um, this isn't a spoiler because. Um, if you haven't seen it, then you should be ashamed of yourself. And if you um, have seen it, then you'll love it. Um, oh, no, it's Sanjiro. That's what it is. Sanjiro. Uh, yeah, okay. We won't watch the whole scene, but uh, there we go. Let's do it. <laughs> that blood spurt is the greatest. Blah. <laughs> oh, what a great movie. If you haven't watched this movie, watch this movie. It's freaking fantastic. This guy is amazing. Anyway, um, all right. So, Celeritas, right? That seemed pretty fast, right? And um, excellent expert martial arts. Uh, I'll Martial artists seem to be very fast. So fine, okay, we have a basic understanding of what these are, Prudentia, Ardacia, Celeritas, Fortitudo. But how do we take that to the floor? So it seems as if Fortitudo and Prudentia come together. And that's because mere knowledge of the art doesn't mean you can do it. Right. You can have somebody who's a book smart about Fiore. In fact, you have often lots of people on the Internet <laughs> who have, you know, who are book smart, quote unquote, whatever that means on Fiore. But if they were to actually attempt to fence, to attempt to fight, they cannot perform the things they know. And a common reason for being un unable to perform the things you know is because of issues with your fortitudo. One of the advantages of maintaining a strong, upright, and conservative posture is that staying in posta gives you opportunities. And this is one of the main utilities of the POSTA system. It is that being in POSTA, when you have to make a decision, allows you to use the art you know. And so by maintaining your fortitudo, specifically by maintaining your fortitudo, you open up the book of the art that you know. And you allow yourself the opportunity to do the things you know when they need to be done.
right? Now, I say this as somebody who, uh, my fencing style, my fighting style, at least these days, or these last number of years, includes a lot of movement. And the the problem with movement is, of course, every time you move, you're risking losing some portion of your fortitudo, making a mistake in your footwork and your balance and your, your, your momentum, right? There's tons of ways you can, you know, the, the person who usually fucks this up is us. Almost, I would say almost 95% of the time, right? When your enemy can get a hold of your fortitudo, yeah, okay, they're going to do you. But most of the time, we start this problem right? We ruin a fortitudo in small ways that compound and compound and compound. And we find ourselves unable to do things we know, even though we've recognized the time to do them. So prudentia and fortitudo come together in that maintaining a conservative posture, even during moments of significant violence, right? Maintaining this conservative posture not only, you know, uh, keeps you safe in that, you know, keeps you upright and 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 uh, allows you to do the things you know to defend yourself, right? But it it more importantly it unlocks your ability to perform the art that you know that you've studied. And the reverse is that with with a terrible fortitudo or with your fortitudo half missing or gone, regardless of how much you know, you're not going to be able to do it, to do the things you know in the proper time. Or it's unlikely that, you will, that you'll be able to. Okay? So, um, these two go together very intimately. Okay? And these two go together very intimately. So speed. This is something that's said very often by um, uh, older martial artists, older fighters, people who have been around the block. That speed is not about being fast. It's about being quick, right? It's about doing only what's required when it's required. And that's what makes people look fast, right? So the speed that we're looking for, this the way to get this tiger-like speed in the art is, of course, first by knowing, knowing our plays, knowing our poses, knowing our transitions. And, of course, it's by keeping a stable and conservative posture that allows us to make all of our transitions instantly, whenever we need to do that. But the speed is by doing everything only just enough. Also, in the right time. So to know when is the right time to do something, that is very much an element of prudentia. Unlocking yourself, allowing yourself to do the thing, a chance to do the thing in the right time, very much what Fortitudo gives you. Celeritas means, you know, that you've done that thing in the right time and only just enough. And, you know, the more and more I study martial arts, the more I, I really believe that every time we step on the floor, Every moment, uh, motion we make, we're always practicing just enough, you know, just enough of, a, of an increase, not not three inches, 2.9 inches, right? Just enough of a motion to the right or the left, you know, just a little, you know, uh, a decrease in the angle of your sword, one degree, two degrees, right? And when the shit hits the fan... When the pressure's on, you still only move just enough, and that is one of the that is one of the things that really shows mastery in in fighting, because of course the conventional way that two people two martial artists fight is that well one attacks the other 
and one puts pressure on the other. Time pressure, right? Um, pressure of position. And the mounting pressure encourages errors in judgment and encourages errors in, you know, it encourages er errors in prudentia, right? It encourages errors in fortitudo and it encourages errors in, uh, errors in celeritas, right? Every time we do an action in fencing that really emphasizes an over parry, right? That is awesome shit because that is, that is, a, that is a barrier, a huge barrier to our enemy maintaining their uh, their celeritas, right? That enemy has to fight every instinct in their body. If you know we're encouraging an over parry, and they don't over parry, right? Because there's nothing we can really do to make an enemy make a mistake. They could be perfect, but of course we try. We give them every opportunity for uh, to make their own errors. And there's tons of things we do in fencing and in fighting that encourage errors in these attributes. We encourage errors in, in, in celerity tests all the time, over commitments, to two quick actions. And this key to celerity tests is moving just enough and in the right time. And if I could say one thing about what characterizes the martial arts or the, the fencing and the martial arts of newer people, it's that when you finally start to put it together and you're finally starting to spar, you're starting to learn how to do all these things, you know, you're thinking a ton, that's taking time. You're, you know, trying to stay stable and you're trying to, you know, prevent your fortitudo from being, you know, removed and that's taking time. And everything's just taking time. And it's so difficult do just enough and in the right time because with in fencing that is an incredible challenge the right time is the moment an instant that's as fleeting as any moment an instant ever it just comes in it it's gone and you missed it and you can't chase it it's gone forever it'll you know you might get another moment but the moment you missed will never be there again and with a combination of all these four attributes with a with including audacia celeritas and audacia combined with prudentia and fortitudo allow and create the image of, a, of an, an expert martial artist that seems like they can tell the future it seems like they know what someone's going to do they react to it in the right time and in the complete way right and this isn't any, anything necessarily mystical this is the practical realities of these attributes as they hit us on the floor and what they're allowing us to do. So the last one is audacia. Okay. So doing, you know, acting just enough in, in the right time. Where audacia, where the rubber hits the road with audacia is having the courage, having the heart to take that moment. Right. So you know what the right moment is. You've allowed yourself to do the thing. You can, you, you can do the thing in just enough. And you know the right time to do it. All you have to do is do it. And that's why I think this is the most important attribute. And this is why I also think Fiore says it's the most important attribute. You know, saying this is, you know, the just do it attribute that's a little simple uh, oversimplifying it but damn martial arts is an is the art of doing all of this all the rest of this is bullshit if this doesn't happen once all this set, is set up you have to have the courage to actually do it and if that last piece is there you, you you've got this right you've got the art the in in, in in whole right and it comes together and and you know in those moments you know occasionally we we feel those moments occasionally we see those moments from our um our compatriots right our fellow scholars and 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 and, and uh, members of emma those are really special moments when these all come together because this shit is so hard it's so hard to get all of these working together in the right proportion and in, in the right way
you know but that's what we're aiming for right um you know this is this is why this is why you know uh the art does not you know the art does not exist here in part right in some sort of insufficient you know in some sort of half trained way right either we're doing this or we're not right and you know all of us are students in the art and it's going to take a lifetime to even attempt to approach getting somewhere where really everything is working together right but um i i certainly believe that it's important to keep this in mind and to you know just because this is hard not to be satisfied with partial successes right if you trained for 10 years and finally had one play where all of this clicked and you got it that's 10 years worth uh worth struggling right but if you trained for 50 years and you never had anything really come together that would be sad right because it's possible right but you have to have it as a goal so um there's a lot in this page it's a lot in this page it's very important um and though it often seems mystical to us it's certainly my position that you can break down these animals at least into ideas that you can take to the sow floor and use to critically assess your own performance and your own fencing and if you watch your own videos um, you know, if you're while you're doing critical assessment of your own work, which, you know, I, I hope and assume everyone does, um, you can use these things to take a harsh look at yourself or an honest look at yourself, because, of course, there's nothing wrong with that and see where th where where are some things that you're lacking. Right. Um, you know. There's other smaller things here, like a celeritas of late in, in recent years. I've come to believe that one of the ways to order your body motion in order to help you do just enough is to move your um, hands and feet together. This is a very sort of arbitrary uh, style of moving, um, but I've, I've come to really love it. It's really helped me order myself. So I advocate this all the time uh, to people. Um, that their hands and feet should move together always and in proportion. Small hand motion, small foot motion, always moving hand and feet together with everything, um, no matter no matter what. Uh, I think that really helps bring bring celerity tests out. But that's just that's just only one way to do it. Um, you know, a fortitudo. Um, you know, Emma has a pretty universal, I think, between the chapters way of expressing fortitudo. There isn't anybody that's really an outlier here. Um, we all really get a good dose of fortitudo from wrestling and dagger, and that seems to carry through to the sword. Um, you know, prudentia is kind of just a matter of study, right? Constant training. And audacia is, you know, for for me, and I can all I all I can really do is talk about it for me. Audacia is one of the things that I don't ever really, it's hard for me to work on unless I feel there's risk. And I think that's because I'm a human being, right? But I need to, I need to feel some risk uh, in order to challenge my Audacia. If I don't feel I'm, like I'm in danger, if there's no risk, then there's no, you know, there's no reason, there's no cost for my failure here. There's no cost to a lack of Audacia, right? Um, you, you know, <sighs> why bother right what is what is the thing that's going to help bring this element of your humanity out if it's not risk because if there's nothing to bring it out you know why would it come out right and so you know when i can in in my training i i try and leave off protective equipment you know i hand protection specifically i try and go without um in order to introduce some risk to myself and and also to introduce a situation where if I fuck up, I'm going to get some pain. Uh, I'm going to get some pain feedback and that's going to motivate my audacia for the next time, because human beings, of course, um, we're not just intellectual beings. We do have um, uh, core things about us and remembering when you got hit in the ribs by Kel that 100th goddamn time doing that same goddamn thing. The hundredth time he does that to me, I'm going to defend it. <laughs> and if I didn't get chopped in half 
50 times before that by him doing that exact same thing in a way that hurt, what's the motivation for me to defend it the hundredth time other than some sort of active sheer abstract will? I don't think that really suffices. And so for me, um, you know, and this is again for me, audacia is something that can be pursued with an increase of comfort, right? With an increase in training, but ultimately it's about assuming some sort of risk, upping the intensity of what you're doing, upping the skill level of the people you're doing it with, you know, um, reducing the equipment necessarily that you're wearing, trusting more in your art to prevent the pain of failure than your equipment, right? Because of course, again, we're not going into this, at least initially anyway, we're not going into this with the goal of being able to train Fury's art so we can fight in a fencing mask with a blunt sword in a cell. Fury is teaching us this art with, uh, about sharp weapons, an art fighting in earnest to the death to defend yourself in a situation where your life is truly at risk. And so while I might not necessarily ever put myself there exactly, right? I'm not crazy. <laughs> it does seem in keeping, at least in my view, with the spirit of what Fury is doing here to consume as much risk as we are capable of doing. Uh, as we are capable of doing, um, what's the word? Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a word here. Usefully, right? Assume as much risk as is, as, as is useful, as is possible, right? Um, notwithstanding, you know, the potential consequences. But there you go. There's my kind of little spiel about um, the Senyo and what it kind of means to us and how to take it onto the floor uh, of the cell. Um, so, uh, Kel, do you have anything to uh, to say about the Senyo? Well, I'll say this about the Senyo of the PD or Navadi, as they usually call it. All the posters are there. You see all the posters in all these angles. Mm -hmm. And that possibly more important lesson is from where do your guards come? From where do your attacks leave? Mm. These are the, the lessons that are written in here by where the posters are placed. Oh, you know, the other stuff you run about, there's all, all kinds of different ways to look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I like to think of Audacia as boldness, mm. not courage so much. Uh, it's just being willing to go and attack and not be intimidated. Yeah. Uh, the other things, you know, once you learn a little more about what these animals represented to a person of this era of a humanist education, and that's not the easiest thing to do. There's only a couple of books that even bother going into it. And they're really more about philosophy than they are about practicality. Mm. Um, the Getty version of this doesn't have the posters listed in it, but it does have uh, fairly clear illustrations of the values of, of these particular uh, animals and what they meant and uh, we regularly say compass and compass is a different tool. This is a divider. Hmm. Um, this, the difference between the Gaddy and the PD, the PD is a young man. Uh, it is perhaps a scholar, right? Someone who's learning the art, has some confidence in it. Uh, and, and these are the lessons that he has to absorb. Uh, the Senyo page of the Getty is a wiser man, a man that already has these attributes. He's uh, well off enough to be extremely well dressed. This is uh, a bit old fashioned uh, dress for uh, late 15th century. This is the dress of, of a magister, a, a teacher, um, you know, in period or a very wealthy merchant or an extremely wealthy nobleman. Well, a wealthy nobleman would have more bling on him. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, the, the idea that this is someone who has put in time, 
is what's most important about the Sanio page. These are all the attributes mm. that have to be maintained and held in your mind and your spirit at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an overall look at our Masari. Mm -hmm. So when you think of all of these things as separate chess pieces or, or elements of play, you're really thinking of it incorrectly. This is the um, distillation, the condensation of our Masari on one page. That's all I'm going to say about it. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Kel. Um, okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions about the Senyo page? Anything they want to ask before we um, move on? Let's all join hands and contact the living. All right. Okay, cool. So um, great. That Let that suffice for our treatment of the Senyo. Um, <clears throat> all right. So now what? Now where are we at? Whoa, we're into the, on the other side of the mirror. We're on to the armored portion of the manuscript. Wow, that's crazy. So, hmm. All right. So what we'll do, I guess, in the last 15 minutes, I don't want to really get into anything um, too much, um, but I just want to maybe, we'll take a little bit of an overview of what we're about to see in the next number of sessions, right? What's in store for us in the armored section. And then um, maybe, uh, Cal, if, I, if you don't mind, I'll ask you maybe at the end or whenever to give some sort of maybe, if you have any comments about the armored pieces in general, um, that would be cool. Um, to kind of give give us a little uh, a little um, a little taster. Uh, I'm of the opinion that maybe we should show the guards and give a bit of an explanation about why they're called that, so that people will get a taster to look into it and perhaps have some questions. Um, as far as the mm -hmm. the hydra that is shown in both. Uh, the armor on foot and the uh, armor uh, equestrian section. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff there because there's a lot of mm. variety and and that's another topic altogether. Uh, yeah. So I I mean, I would suggest for the last little bit that okay. we just look at the six um, guards of sword and armor mm -hmm. and contrast them to the variety of much larger variety sword. I'm sorry, um, in, um, in two hands. Okay. Sorry, Kelly, you're breaking up a teeny bit there, but I think I yeah. got what you said. Yeah. All right. So, um, perfect. So let's, um, let's do that. So, um, okay. Um, so we're just going to do that as an, as an overview. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to read the, um, do our normal read through the posts. We'll just, let's just do what Kel said. We'll look at these and see what we got and we'll compare them to the sword in two hands. So, all right. So um, here we are in the sword and, and armor section. Broadly speaking, we have the guards and the plays. Um, in the next number of sections, sword and armor, the axe and armor, and the spear, that's going to be the general um, organization of the sections, the guards and then the plays. The mounted section, um, well, we'll leave that till them. There's the mounted section. <laughs> So sword and armor, um, we of the guards we have six, and these have names. Um, these have uh, specific names: Posta Breve La Serpentina, Posta Di Vero Croce, uh, so the Low Serpent, True Cross, High Serpent, um, Middle Iron Gate. Post of Sagittaria, Guard of the Archer, and Bastard Cross. True Cross, uh, sorry, Low Serpent, True Cross, High Serpent, Middle Iron Gate, 
Proposal Sagittaria and Bassett Cross. Yeah. Now um, we've. Yep. I would like to point out that uh, the first one is actually short serpent. Sure. To low serpent. I I apologize. Low. Uh, sorry. Short serpent. Yeah. Uh, that's 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 my bad. Short serpent. So um, we have in fact seen these before. Or those of you who might remember, we may have seen something like these before. And that's because in, in this little tool that I'm using, um, I, I've named other posters with similar names. So um, let's go to the sword and two-hand section and recall what we saw previously. So in the guards section of the sword and two hands, of the first six guards, we see posters that look similar. So Folio 22RC, I have named, Alex, I have named Posta Sagittaria because uh, in my understanding of what this is, it's the same Posta as here. But of course, that's not written in the manuscript. That's my sc scholarly opinion. People very well may differ. But we do see, regardless, that Posta Sagittaria here, the actual Posta Sagittaria, and in 33RA, and this posta at 22RC looks similar. So isn't that interesting? Okay. Um, one of the mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. we should note is that in the wider Fury community, mm -hmm. there are people that call these unnamed guards masters of battle, or the master's battle, or mm -hmm. battle masters, or whatever. And there's absolutely no none nothing to support that in the text i've never but, even read that i don't even know where that comes from yeah, actually no, you you get it from uh when you when you travel to other events and meet people in other schools you'll hear them use the term from the, oh and you hold it like the master battle and blah blah okay. blah um in in particular fury says and these are different ways to hold the sword mm -hmm. literally that's all he says about them yeah, that text is in Sagittarius, is in uh, 22RC. He says, we are six guards, each dissimilar from the other. I'm the first to explain my nature. That's it. Yeah. That's all he says. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so um, 22RC is similar to post, uh, to, to 33RA, post Sagittarius, but isn't, isn't that interesting? Um, oops. Where do we see? Okay. So we also see, um, excuse me. We also see, uh, Short Serpent, 22VA, this poster here, looks similar to... In both cases, the swords... 32VA. The same way... It's very, very in, true. In, in the uh, unarmored uh, pre-masters, uh, ways to hold the sword, mm -hmm. as they are in the armored section, the grips are different. Ah, so, absolutely. Although they, mm -hmm. uh, they have some structural similarity, their applications are different. For example, the first mm -hmm. uh, uh, plate here, which you've called post Sagittaria Folio 22RC, mm -hmm. the hand is actually cupping the cross mm -hmm. because this is uh, uh, the means to cast the sword. Mm -hmm. And it's like throwing a dart underhand mm -hmm. uh, or a javelin underhand. It puts quite a spin on the sword. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the third one after that, which you've dubbed Post the mm. Breve Serpentina 22VA, mm. the uh, right hand of the sword is slipped down to yes. the pommel yes. instead of up by the cross where it is in sh uh, Short Serpent. So mm -hmm. you must be careful not to cast names upon uh, things that are superficially similar because they're not used the same way if you tried to use that grip on your sword in short serpent and came in contact with another blade that sword would be out of your hands in a second right so so um uh i, I do want to make it clear that in this respect with these posters my mm -hmm. naming convention here um yeah. For the, sa for the sake of this that. tool, my naming convention is based on the similarity to, this, to the, the, the sword and armored section. Um, you know, 
and though I do have a, a scholarly opinion as to why they might be suited to be called that, it, it's 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 my opinion. It's arbitrary, right? This isn't this isn't me reflecting. Uh, this naming convention isn't re reflecting the text of the uh, of the image. And, and your your clarifications there, Keller, are exactly uh, correct. And I would I would want to point out the same thing. They're similar in image, you know, if images matter, but there are some important differences, um, and uh, and uh, it's important that we recognize them. Absolutely. Good. Um, so we also let's see. Stop, let's stop going back to those other plates then, because they're not really relevant to these. Well, uh, sure. Okay. So, so suffice it to say then that we've seen plays. Oh, we've seen post a similar in the sword and two hands section. Um, you know, so true cross, short serpent, middle iron gate, right? Um, the per possibly Sagittaria um, we've seen. High Serpent, we haven't seen, uh, and the Bastard Cross, we haven't seen, insofar as we haven't seen the sword held high in both hands, or held low in both hands. Though, of course, this position is roughly similar to um, something like Left Tail, right? And I, so when I say roughly, I mean roughly, right? But it's not as if this is super, super crazy new. Right, an image, and of course, this posta is also similar to something like Finestra, right? So again, it's important here to uh, note the similarities and differences, things that are familiar and and things that aren't. But to Cal's point, and Cal, please do say more about this. These first six posta here in the sword and armor section are going to form the a significant basis of how we proceed in the rest of the book. And these posters are going to repeat in the Polak section. Is that not so? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing to notice is with the added weight of armor, all of these stances, all of these posters are deep, widely based. Hmm. Um, their feet are not close together because it adds much, much trouble to your elephant. Indeed. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things that we're going to do next week, I hope, is we're going to say some, we're going to say some words about the new context that we're going to be studying. So, you know, we we we've tried to set out some sort of broad overview of each new different context we've approached thus far in our study. You know, what is wrestling really? What's the deal with it? Blah blah blah. What is dagger really? What are we dealing with? Et cetera, et cetera. Sword, whatever. Now that we're into the second half of the book, we're going to be dealing with the art in armor. So it's going to be critical for us to at least have some passing concept of what it did, what it means to place yourself in armor. What you know, what you can do now, what you can't do now, the things that you that you're at risk now that you weren't before, and things that you don't have to care about anymore, all that sort of thing. And that with that context, we're going to be able to start looking at the plays. And the post is, as you know, Cal said, and starting to kind of understand what more we're looking at, right? Um, you know, we don't want to make the mistake of thinking that we fight in armor the exact same way we fight outside of armor, right? We don't want to ignore the realities of the thing that we're doing, not least because why would you put on armor if you were going to fight the same way without it, right? Fighting without it, if you're perfect, you'll never be hit. So why need armor? <laughs> Fine. you're putting on armor for a reason so what the hell does it do right what is it you know why even bother so there's a good deal to be said about that so that we don't get lost or make mistakes and assumption um when we're looking at the armored section and especially this is something that i try to remind myself of constantly is that we all have experience living and doing things out of armor very few of us at all have any experience putting on armor ever, period. So we have to be very careful in thinking about fighting in armor as people who have never even, many of us have never even put on a full suit of armor before. Even half a suit. Even, even half a suit, exactly, right? There's going to be lots of things about that basic experience that are just un, unknowable to people who haven't put it on. Right? And that's okay. That's not a criticism per se. But when we're studying, we have to be honest about things we know and things we don't know. 
um, and we don't want to make assumptions here. So we'll get into all of that next next week, much uh, much deeper. Um, uh, Cal, I hope you're on next week. That would be that would be great. I will uh, at this point. I will but, give you one assumption that all of you can carry as we begin great. to study the armored section is that it is not a new part. It is a subset of what we have already studied with specific parameters and um, uh, impediments added to it. Mm. So things that uh, you're trading off to increase your safety, mm. uh, where at one point Fiore says, I'd rather go into the list three times in armor mm -hmm. because there you can take many blows and still win the day. Whereas out of armor, one blow might kill me. Right. Right. That's so right. this is a subset of what Fiori's Kalmasari is all about. It's not a new half or a completely new thing. Right. We must try not mm -hmm. to think of any of the sections, uh, you know, sword and two hand, dagger, mm -hmm. abazari, that, whatever, as completely separate things. They are foundations of all one art. Mm -hmm. Just like the Senyo and all the all the animals come together to be exactly that. Exactly that. Um, all right. Well, um, uh, scholars, uh, uh, Andrew, BD, Connor, uh, do you have anything to add or subtract from today's uh, session? BD here. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of quick comments. First of all, it's interesting to me when you see the mixed weapon sets, just like when you see the dagger versus sword, sword versus dagger, bass and cello section, where I think Fury of the Berry is showing us a, a single way to fight that translates across many weapon sets. <clears throat> Self-defense, duels, uh, open field combat, and then takes it into armor with the added context of the increased weight, the reduced visibility, and the uh, the heat. So I, I almost see this as a series of layering of context as we go across mm -hmm. different weapon sets and armor situations. Good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to. I have to agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. good question. Very good comment. Uh, uh, Connor or Andrew. Nothing I can think of. All right, sir. And Connor, your your uh, uh, <laughs> your Canadian return is, is 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 still okay. It's still the same place that you, that <laughs> that you left. Oh, maybe he can't. He can't hear. Maybe he's having audio issues. <laughs> he hasn't left the audio issues he, behind in China. He live somewhere. Uh, he live somewhere way up north. He's in BC right now, I think. Is he? Yeah, okay. I thought so. Yeah, if it, his audio issues may be the actual computer that he's on. Uh, could be, could be. Well, anyway, um, I'm sure what you had to say, Connor, was uh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. If uh, <laughs> anything at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, then it is ten o'clock. Uh, that. Um, leads us to the end of today's session we did some good work today we finished the sword and two hand section dealt with the clubs section and we um said everything that needed to be said and probably much more besides <laughs> about the senyo so all in all um fantastic night um as always i'm really glad to have every, all of you here um i've recently got some uh, positive comments about um the utility of these of these sessions um, i really do hope they have some lasting usefulness um, for when we uh, come back to the cell even um, and so uh um, I, that's that's great to hear and thank you people for those comments we'll do it every week and um you know the more and more we do this the the, the higher the likelihood it seems to me that there's going to be some utility in doing something like this even when we're back in the cell so this has been a really neat experiment and um, it goes on all right. Um, thank you guys very much for coming. Please be uh, healthy and safe. Uh, and um, we'll see you here next time. Good night, folks. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Have These a great night. These sessions are really great.
Thanks, Aaron. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good one.